today the fact that there's a climate crisis and that we absolutely need to reduce our carbon emissions is pretty clear. But are the different CO2 sources equally easy to decarbonize? And do we have enough electricity to replace carbon-based energy sources? The stakes are high. We are talking about nothing less than saving the world. In the next talk, Hanno Böck, who is a journalist and re security researcher, will give us answers to these questions. Hanno, we're really happy to have you here today. Um, hello, um, my name is Hanno. I'm a journalist and um, I have lately covered a lot more topics around climate change and the energy transition. And in this talk, I want to highlight a few things that I think are particularly challenging in this area. Yeah, so why are we talking about this? I mean, obviously, I guess um, everybody knows that um, we're in a climate emergency and um, it is necessary that the, we do something about it. So uh, we need to stop greenhouse gas emissions and uh, on, at least on the medium to long term, we really need to stop all greenhouse gas emissions and move to a zero emissions economy. And uh, usually when people think about uh, stopping greenhouse gas emissions, about tackling climate change, they, they think about things like this. Like, um, yeah, okay, we have um, things like coal power plants um, or other fossil powered power plants and we move away, we need to move away from that and build up uh, renewable energy like uh, uh, primarily uh, wind and solar. Um, or you might also think about something like this, that today we have uh, cars that are driven with with fossil fuels essentially and we want to move away from that uh, on the one hand to electric vehicles but of course we can also think about moving to other modes of transport like trains which are uh, in a lot of cases already electric or also to I improving the situation for cycling and walking. Um, and I mean, all of that is, is good. This helps a lot. Um, this is, um, yeah, this tackles a, a huge part of the problem. But there's kind of the bad news is that this was the easy part. And there's a lot more that we need to decarbonize. We need to move to zero emissions. That is much more challenging. So we have, uh, we have, emissions in industry, for example, in steel production or in cement. And we have things like aviation or also things like the production of chemicals and plastics that are very challenging when we want to move to, um, when we want to reduce emissions there or even uh, get rid of emissions. Um, so when we think about moving to a climate neutral economy, Usually the idea people have is that uh, it's basically two steps. The first is that, okay, we need to clean up our electricity production. We need to move away from coal and gas to uh, primarily renewables. And also uh, then as a next step, we need to move all other uses of energy to electricity. So we need to electrify almost everything. Um, so to get a bit of an idea uh, what cleaning up electricity means, um, right now we have uh, roughly a worldwide electricity production of 26 petawatt hours per year. So that is all the electricity in all the power plants in the world. This is a number from 2018, which is like the last year where there are these statistics. It's also of course obviously a, a non-corona year, like this year is is obviously very special. Um, and I, I want to come back to this a, a bit during the talk as a reference, because I think this is something we can imagine. Like all the electricity that is produced today, because later on I will say in certain situations, if we want to move this to electricity, then we will need that much electricity and that is 
that much percent of today's electricity production. Because I think that's just a, a, a good way to visualize how big the challenges are. Um, yeah, um, how is this electricity today produced? Um, here's a little chart. Uh, so uh, the black thing, which is uh, unfortunately still the biggest chunk, is uh, electricity production from coal. And then we also have a big chunk of natural gas. And the, the thing where we want to move to is the stuff in the upper right, like the light blue one is wind energy, which is still relatively small, but it, it's rapidly growing. And solar, which is uh, the light yellow part, which is even smaller, but is uh, growing even more rapidly. Then we have some hydropower, which is, um, it depends a bit on the situation, but it's mostly uh, relatively good, but uh, it, it will probably not, not grow massively. Um, yeah. Um, here's a chart which uh, shows the development of prices of electricity production. And this is one of the things that is uh, very promising. And that is, if you look at this red line, which uh, visualizes the price of solar energy, that has gone down very massively. And we have another, this dark blue line, which is for uh, wind energy, for onshore wind energy, so wind energy built on the land, not in the sea. Um, that is, has also gotten very, very cheap. So this is, uh, this is good, right? So renewable energy, particularly wind and solar, they've gotten really cheap. Uh, prices were reduced massively. So we can build up more of it and um, move in the right direction with that. Um, what uh, may is also interesting in this chart is this uh, green line, which is the price of nuclear, which is actually uh, the form of energy that has the biggest increase in prices. So building nuclear power plants is getting more expensive and not cheaper, which uh, maybe one should keep in mind in discussions because some people consider nuclear a very important part of future solutions and maybe just without even going into a discussion about safety or any of that, uh, just the idea of, uh, of considering an energy form that is expensive and is getting even more expensive if we want to move quickly to uh, cleaner forms of energy, maybe it's not the best idea. Um, so yeah, uh, so cleaning up the electricity sector, it is still a huge task. But uh, the thing is, we, we mostly know how to do it. We need to remove to renewables. Of course, there are still challenges around storage and flexibility. But I guess these are, it, it's, it, it, it seems doable. And it's, and the large part of the path, it, it's clear what we need to do. Um, but then there are more challenges ahead, and that is uh, getting all the other sectors to also decarbonize. Um, one sector that is particularly challenging is uh, steel production. So what you can see here is a so-called blast furnace, um, uh, um, an industrial plant to produce steel. And uh, the steel production is currently responsible for around 7% of the carbon dioxide emissions in the world. And that is, uh, and usually steel is produced using coal. So, and something to, that is important to know here is that the emissions from steel production, that's not simply energy. It's not simply we burn the coal to need some heat or, or to, to drive some process, but uh, it is actually the chemistry within this steel blast furnace that is causing the carbon dioxide emissions. Um, I, I thought about writing down the chemical formulas, but for steel they are relatively complicated. So I will, uh, I, I think, but the important part is to get the basic idea that what is happening here is that what we put into such a steel plant is carbon in the form of coal, which is mostly carbon and we put in iron oxide. So that is a chemical that is a binding of, 
oxygen atoms and iron atoms. And what we get out is um, carbon dioxide and pure iron. So, and the carbon dioxide comes out in the form of emissions and goes into the atmosphere. And that is causing these high emissions from steel production. Um, so if we want to move away from that, the technology that is currently seems to be most promising is something called direct reduced iron with uh, hydrogen. Um, so there's already, uh, there are already uh, some steel plants, it's um, around 7% of the worldwide production that are using natural gas instead of coal and they're using something called direct reduction. So with natural gas, it's still a fossil fuel. It's still causing carbon emissions. They are a bit lower than from coal, but not that much actually. Um, but uh, the good thing here is that you can actually replace this natural gas with hydrogen. And it seems technically, this is only a relatively small change. So we have an existing technology that uh, that is known how, how to operate and you can switch off the natural gas for hydrogen uh, and get a cleaner process there. Um, the, there's, an, uh, there's a project from some Swedish companies, the hybrid project, which is currently the most ambitious plan to implement such hydrogen-based steel production. It is um, run by the uh, by SSAB, which is a, a big steel producer both in Sweden and in Finland, and LKAB, which is a steel mining company, and Vattenfall, which is the Swedish state electricity company. Um, and uh, they have announced this last year, and in a press release, SSAB said that they actually, uh, their goal is that to have the company fossil free uh, in the year 2045 at the latest. Now we can argue that uh, you could say maybe this is too late because if we really take the climate goal seriously, then we need to move much faster. Uh, but still at least th this, this is an ambitious goal because we're talking about an industry that basically uh, hasn't done much to reduce carbon emissions until now. Um, and uh, right now there is uh, quite a lot of momentum about this hydrogen-based steel production. So this, uh, this Swedish project is not the only project. There are also a number of, for example, German companies that are currently uh, working on, on pilot projects for hydrogen-based steel. Um, and what I find interesting about this, this is that there seems to be really currently a, a push from the industry that they want to have it and also a push from actually labor unions that say we want to uh, go into that direction, which is quite different from some other industries where you often have both the industry and the labor unions more and putting the brakes on, uh, like if you think in the car industry, uh, they are not the ones who want to move it forward to a more climate friendly production. But in steel, this seems to be different right now. And uh, I, I mean, you can, we can discuss why this is the case. Uh, and obviously they are not, not just doing this uh, out of uh, concern about the world, but also uh, the steel companies just hope that they will get a lot of state support for this hydrogen-based steel, which may give them a competitive advantage. But still, I find it interesting that, that uh, here seems to be a push from industry to move this forward. Um, now we may wonder uh, if we use hydrogen and if we produce that hydrogen from electricity, which is like the way you want to do it if we want to get climate friendly hydrogen, uh, how much electricity would we need for that? And um, I, I've done a calculation here, so I've calculated this myself just for transparency, but I have taken the numbers from the Swedish hybrid project because they, they have published numbers about the what they expect the electricity per ton of steel to be. And then I have taken numbers uh, from the current world steel production. And if you multiply the additional electricity required for this hydrogen-based steel process, 
you end up with uh, something around six petawatt hours per year. Um, and this is um, around 23% of the world electricity production. So this is, I mean, it's a lot. It, it's uh, around a quarter of the world electricity production that you would have to add and then move to clean electricity in order to clean up the steel sector. But still, it kind of seems doable. Like it, it's not something that seems completely implausible to do. So as we sa just said, we, we can move steel to hydrogen and the same is true for quite a few other sectors. So hydrogen is, is considered a very promising option in a lot of uh, sectors. We should talk a bit about hydrogen in general. So because um, even though hydrogen is very often touted as a climate solution, right now it's also a very big source of, uh, of greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so today we have um, around 70 million tons of hydrogen in use and another 45 million tons that are used uh, uh, in mixed gases. So you have uh, applications where there's pure hydrogen and then there's some applications where you just use hydrogen mixed with other uh, substances in the industry. And almost all of it comes from fossil fuels. Um, and there are two sectors that are the main consumers of hydrogen today. Um, and that is for one, ammonia production, which is a gas that is actually used uh, for fertilizer production. And the other big user are oil refineries. They are actually using it uh, to remove sulfur from raw oil. Um, and the, the main process that is used today to generate this hydrogen is a, a method called steam methane reforming. So methane is the main component of natural gas, so or fossil gas. Um, and uh, this, this process is splitting up the methane, which is uh, uh, the chemical formula is CH4, so it's carbon and hydrogen. Um, and then we get um, hydrogen and CO2, which causes the emissions. There's also uh, some hydrogen production from coal, uh, some from oil, and it's also sometimes a byproduct in other processes, um, particularly in chlorine production. Um, but really the, 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 the major method is this steam methane reforming. So natural gas is the major source of hydrogen production today. Um, and this hydrogen production, which is mostly from fossil fuels, uh, it's responsible for 830 million tons of carbon dioxide per year, which is around 2% of the carbon dioxide emissions today. So that, that's quite a, a significant amount of greenhouse gas emissions from hydrogen production today. Um, there are also some additional emissions and uh, the, and particularly if you're using natural gas, basically in every process where you use natural gas, you will also have methane emissions. And that is just because there are leakages. So if you're, if you're drilling for natural gas, some of the gas will get out and will go into the atmosphere. If you have pipelines, if you have compressors, all the infrastructure for natural gas, there's always a, a, an amount of leakage. And methane itself is a very active greenhouse gas. So if this natural gas gets into the atmosphere, that itself uh, is, um, is a greenhouse gas. Um, and so, so we have a lot of greenhouse gas emissions from hydrogen. So if we want to have hydrogen to be a climate solution, then first uh, hydrogen itself needs to be cleaned up. We need a cleaner hydrogen production. And the, the method that is usually discussed here is electrolysis. Electrolysis is a process where you basically use electricity to split up water. Uh, water is oxygen and hydrogen. So if you split that up, you get pure hydrogen and pure oxygen. Uh, what you can see on this picture is an electrolyzer uh, uh, from the company Enertrack. This is in Prenzlau, which is uh, north of Berlin. Um, which is a pilot project that was started around a decade ago. 
Um, there are some other ideas how to, to have a cleaner hydrogen production. Um, one of them is to still use uh, this methane reforming with natural gas and combine that with, ca with carbon capture and storage, which means capturing the CO2 emissions and then maybe store them in, in geological formations underground. Um, another method in, uh, that is discussed is so-called pyrolysis, which uh, means you're, you're also using natural gas and methane and then you're breaking it up, but not into carbon dioxide, but in, in pure carbon uh, and hydrogen. But uh, the problem with these methods is that they very likely don't provide any path to zero emissions. And the main reason for that is what I mentioned earlier, these, uh, these leakage emissions from natural gas. You will always have these methane emissions. So, uh, so it is questionable whether it actually makes sense to go into these directions because we're not going to go to zero emissions with these technologies. Uh, so electrolysis is promising, but uh, currently the, there's, uh, the amount of hydrogen produced from electrolysis is, is really tiny. It's in the lower percentage area. The, the numbers are a bit uncertain. It depends a bit on, on which source you take, but it, it's not a lot. It, it's really, really tiny. Um, so before this can be significant, it needs to be scaled up a lot. Um, and if we look at the uh, electricity, just the electricity we would need if we would move the current hydrogen production to electrolysis, uh, it would be around 3.6 petawatt hours per year. Uh, this is a number I, I got from a report from the International Energy Agency last year. They made a, uh, an extensive report just on hydrogen. And that is around, would be around 14% of the current world electricity production. So, so even just uh, moving today's hydrogen production to electrolysis would be challenging. Now there's one thing to remark here, and that is that a lot of the current hydrogen production is used in the oil industry. And of course, if we want to move to a zero carbon economy, then, uh, this needs to go away. We no longer want to have an oil industry, um, but still uh, there's a significant amount that, that will be needed in the future. And if we think about all these other areas where we want to move to hydrogen, um, um, then we will need more hydrogen in the future. Um, yeah. Another sector that is very challenging to decarbonize is aviation. So. Um, yeah, airplanes today, they, they run on kerosene, which is a, a product made from oil. And um, aviation is responsible for uh, around 2% of the CO2 emissions. But uh, it's important to know that this is not, this is not the whole story of aviation emissions. Um, and one reason for that is actually what you can see here, these contrails, which are water vapor. Um, so if you burn this uh, kerosene, some water uh, is produced and that is emitted as water vapor. And um, this water vapor has a climate impact and there are other things, uh, for example, nitrous oxide emissions that have a climate impact. And there's an EU research project, the Clean Sky Project, that has uh, recently published a report um, and they have estimated in there that the climate impact from aviation, they have asked experts and looked at existing studies, uh, that they estimated that between three and 7%. And this is really remarkable because this is a, an uncertainty that is more than 100%. So, um, the, so it seems really that if you ask how big is the climate impact of aviation, the answer is really we don't know very well. Um, there's a massive uncertainty and the, the biggest source of uncertainty is actually these water vapor emissions. So water has multiple effects in the atmosphere. It, there are these contrails and then also the water it has impact on cloud, cloud formation. And this is actually very hard to model. And that is why there's just a lot of uncertainty around this. 
Um, so yeah, you might ask, but what can we do? How could aviation become more climate friendly? How can we get rid of these emissions? And it is challenging. Um, so you might uh, consider, okay, uh, we use batteries to, to electrify cars. Maybe we can also use batteries for, for uh, aviation. Um, there actually, there's some effort in doing that. So particularly Norway has some ambitious plans here. So the, the state uh, aviation company in Norway, Avinor, they have actually plans to, to go in that direction and want to have their first plane uh, ready in 2030. And they expect it to be somewhere between 300, 400 kilometers of reach and space for 19 passengers. And I guess you, you can see in which direction this is going. Like this is doable, but we're talking here about relatively short ranges and we're talking about a small number of passengers. Um, and ultimately it's probably, uh, it's not gonna go much further because just the weight of the battery will limit the range and the size of these battery powered planes. So, I mean, uh, in Norway, the situation is a bit special because they have some cities in the north that are relatively small and they are not connected to railway. So uh, these small uh, airplanes are relatively important there. But this is more of a niche thing which will play a part, may play a part in some areas, but will not have a big impact on, on the sector as a whole. Um, another option for aviation is again, hydrogen. So um, recently Airbus announced uh, specific plans that they want to build planes uh, run by hydrogen. Um, they hope to, to achieve up to 3000 kilometers, which is, I mean, it's, it's more than these Norwegian plans, but it's still relatively limited. So this is something that could run aviation within Europe or within the United States, but it's not enough for a transatlantic flight. Um, there's, uh, there's essentially two ways to use hydrogen in an airplane. One is to have a fuel cell which turns hydrogen into electricity and then you basically have an electric plane but you generate the electricity from hydrogen. Or the other one is just to have a gas turbine and directly use the hydrogen within the turbine. And you can also combine these two. Um, so what does it mean if we have hydrogen powered plane, ideally with green hydrogen, obviously, what does it mean for the climate? Uh, so if you burn hydrogen or if you use it in a fuel cell, uh, you get water. Um, so um, apparently it is uh, that hydrogen plates will actually increase these water vapor emissions. Uh, the estimate by this Clean Sky research project is that this will increase the emissions by 150%. And as, as I said earlier, we really have no idea how big the climate effects of these water emissions are. So there's a huge uncertainty here in which direction this is going. It, it might be possible to think about storing that water, particularly this might be possible if you use a fuel cell, um, but that is very speculative. And I mean, all of this is, is of course speculation because we're talking about technology that doesn't exist today. That's very far from realization, but this is an option that should be kept in mind. Maybe this is possible. Um, then uh, the other option that is discussed for airplanes are so-called e-fuels. Um, and the idea here is that, okay, we can use electricity and hydrogen and carbon dioxide, which we can get from the air. I mean, it takes energy, but hydro, uh, carbon dioxide is everywhere. Um, and turn that into hydrocarbons, um, which is the main component of oil and other fuels. So the advantage of this is that um, we get something that is almost like current uh, fuel for planes. It's almost like kerosene. So this doesn't require a lot of changes to the plane. We can use the technology that we have today and just replace the fuel and get a fuel that is made from electricity. But the big disadvantage around this is that 
This is extremely inefficient and it needs a lot of electricity. Um, and just how much um, this Clean Sky Research Project, I already mentioned, they have calculated a number of scenarios for a future aviation industry with a combination of hydrogen and e-fuels. And they looked like a scenario what, what could happen in the year 2050. And if they look at this with e-fuels alone, you end up with 32 petawatt hours per year, which is more than the current world electricity production. And they looked at two scenarios with a combination of hydrogen and e-fuels, one with a higher share of hydrogen and one with a lower share, depending on how fast you could roll out this hydrogen technology. And they end up there with one scenario with 21 petawatt hours or 28 petawatt hours. So uh, this is all within roughly the range of what currently the world electricity production is. So this is really uh, like, it, it seems extremely challenging to have the idea that we would have to have all the electricity production that is used today, clean that up and just use that for the aviation industry. Um, uh, I have to say, when you look at, at into this study, what their assumptions were, then they assumed that the aviation industry would continue to grow at a rapid rate. So they assumed a 4% growth per year, which is less than the growth of aviation in the past, but it's still, uh, this would essentially mean that in 2050, you would have an aviation industry that is more than three times as large as it is today. So it, it would, uh, they are assuming just a massive increase of flights, many more flights, a much uh, larger aviation industry. And I guess it's probably worth discussing whether that's really such a good idea or whether there are other options here, whether we should really talk about limiting that and uh, talk about a smaller aviation industry. Yeah. Um, yeah, another sector that we need to consider is uh, chemicals and things like plastic production. Um, because, um, I mean, almost all the products we use today, they contain uh, plastics or they contain other chemicals that are usually made from either oil or from natural gas. And um, with these chemicals, with these chemicals from fossil fuels, uh, we need to consider two forms of emissions. One is the emission uh, before we use that product in production. And there are, for example, emissions during the, the drilling of oil and gas. Um, there are emissions in the refinery process. And then also there are emissions after using these products. If we have something that's made out of plastic, it may end up in a landfill or it may end up burned in a waste incinerator. In both cases, that leads to further emissions. Um, or there are also things like, for example, a lot of these chemicals are fertilizers and the fertilizers, when they are brought out, they, they emit actually nitrous oxide, which itself is a very active greenhouse gas and which is also very hard to avoid. Um, so uh, the solution that is usually proposed for the chemical sector is a, a range of technologies that are summed up under this, this term power to X. And the idea here is it, it's very similar to the e-fuels that we talked about earlier, is that you take CO2, that you take that out of the air, then you take hydrogen that you can make from electrolysis, and from that you can go on and create all kinds of chemicals that we need. Um, there has been a talk that I would recommend watching that was on the uh, camp last year, and I've put a link here and uh, you can get the slides later. So if you're interested to look into this in detail, there is the, was this talk. Um, there, um, there has been a study where they tried to calculate what it would mean if we would have a, a chemical industry that is using carbon capture and use technology, which is basically that what I said, we take CO2 out of the air and then we combine it with hydrogen and turn it into chemicals. Um, and they calculated a scenario for the year 2030. Uh, so this has had a little bit of growth, so it was a bit more uh, chemicals than used today, but it, it was not, not these crazy growth projections like the aviation example we had earlier. Um, and they ended up with two scenarios. One was uh, with technologies that are mostly already available today 
uh, and the other was with more speculative technologies. So technologies where they said this, this will be possible in the future, but we don't have this developed yet. And they end up with, this, uh, with an estimate that we would need electricity between 18 and 32 petawatt hours per year, which is again roughly in the range of one time the, the world electricity production today, which we would need to have this chemical sector uh, with the, uh, made from electricity. Yeah. So another sector that is uh, considered as very challenging to decarbonize is the production of uh, cement. Um, so cement, there's also similar to the steel issue, we have a, a chemical uh, source of emissions and that is that uh, uh, cement, what, what is done there is that you take a, a calcium carbonate which is uh, calcium, carbon and oxygen um, and you turn that into calcium oxide and you also get uh, carbon dioxide in this process. Um, and these uh, cement emissions, these chemical cement emissions this is around 5% of the worldwide carbon dioxide emissions. Uh, the overall cement emissions are even higher because there's also energy emissions. Um, but there's also kind of a bit of a, a nit that some of these emissions are actually reabsorbed over the lifetime of the cement. But that is, um, but it's, it still ends up that, that cement is a huge source of carbon dioxide emissions. And there's really not and no technology that has uh, a perspective of bringing down these cement emissions to zero or even close to that. So uh, the only option that is, that, uh, that is uh, available here is really to actually capture these carbon dioxide emissions and to store them underground. And uh, this is a technology that is known as CCS or carbon capture and storage. And um, yeah, just just recently, like uh, two weeks ago, the uh, company Heidelberg Cement, they announced that they want to build uh, such a CCS facility at a cement plant in Norway, although they, for at the beginning, they only plan with a 50% capture rate. And the reason for that is actually that they, they will use heat for this uh, CCS process, and they want to use waste heat from their cement plant, and they don't have enough heat to uh, get to a higher capture rate. But it, it would be possible to go to much higher capture rates. Um, so CCS has been proposed as a climate solution for many years, but it has not been very successful until now. Um, and also, and this is uh, like a bit of the problem here, CCS has often been used as kind of an excuse. For example, we had this in Germany, like when the last wave of new coal power plants was built, then you often had this argument where people said, yeah, but these, these emissions from coal, they are not really a problem because we have the CCS technology, which at some point in the future we will add to these power plants, which was never really very plausible, but this was the discussion that we had. Um, and uh, also, like if you look at the existing CCS projects today, most of them are actually doing something that is called enhanced oil recovery which means you're taking the CO2, you're pumping it into an old oil field, and that allows you to squeeze out a little bit more of oil from these oil fields, which, uh, I mean, at first, obviously, that is not very good for the climate because it needs more oil production. Uh, but also, there's, there, uh, there are a lot of concerns, like in the US, there's some uh, oil companies get some subsidy if they actually do this uh, because they are doing something for the climate, right? Uh, but it's not very well monitored and there have been cases where this uh, CO2 was leaking out of old oil wells. Um, and yeah, th this whole thing is very problematic. Um, so, so yeah, CCS overall is very controversial and it is problematic, but for cement, uh, there really isn't much of an alternative. And um, so it, it is probably a direction, uh, that it, it's something that needs to be done in this sector. Um, yeah, uh, I just want to briefly mention uh, that there are a lot of other sectors that are also very challenging that I won't go into detail. One of them is uh, like 
of agriculture and particularly meat production. Um, then there is shipping, which um, is mostly based on fossil fuels. One promising option there may be to use ammonia created from electricity. Then there's also, of course, trucks and street transport. Um, there, it seems also electrification with batteries may play a big role in the future. And then there's the whole topic of heating, and that is like both heating of in the domestic sector, but also in industry where you have industrial processes that need a lot of heat. Um, yeah, so, yeah. Um, and then there's another big topic, and that is uh, negative emissions. So um, the, a lot of the climate scenarios that the IPCC has calculated, they assume that at some point in the future, we will not just stop emitting carbon dioxide, but they also assume that we will suck emissions out of the atmosphere just because we have already emitted so much CO2 that in order to, to get to a safe climate, we, we just need to rever reverse that process and get these emissions back. Um, and I mean, one option to do this is renaturation. If you plant a tree, it, it uh, binds carbon dioxide, but this has limits. I mean, there's, there's just not enough space to do this at a large scale. So uh, one technology, that, one possibility that's discussed there is to use something called direct air capture, which uh, basically just means we take the CO2 out of the air and then we use CCS. So then we store it underground. Um, yeah, um, and there was a pub study published in Nature Communications that tried to calculate the, the energy needs for that because um, the, this would be huge and they ended up like with some of these scenarios you end up with something like 83 petawatt hours per year in the year uh, 2100 and that is um, around three th times the electricity production of the world today. So it, it's really hard to, to contemplate that this would actually be possible. Uh, and even more so if you think about what, what should the economics behind this be? Because there's not really an incentive for someone to build these air capture machines. It would be something you do f for, for the world climate, but not, you wouldn't have a, a personal incentive to actually do that. Yeah, Yeah. so some conclusions from this. So, I mean, I guess it's very obvious that this is all extremely challenging. Like, in, in some th there are no good options in many sectors and it, it takes sometimes insane amounts of energy to actually do this. And many of these technologies are in very, very early stages. Um, and I, I guess this is the biggest takeaway that this just requires massive amounts of electricity. Like we just need to contemplate that if we want to go that path, we need multiple times the electricity production today. And uh, just a few thoughts how, how I think we should think about that. I mean, first of all, yeah, we need to build lots and lots of wind and solar energy. And we should really think about think big about this. Like something like this is currently one of the biggest solar installations in the world. This is one in India. So really huge amounts of solar energy in the desert. I guess I mean we should build solar energy everywhere where it's feasible, but we should really also think about these really big projects where we can have massive amounts of them. And yeah, the same with wind. I mean, this is an offshore wind farm. This is um, an, an offshore wind farm in Denmark. But yeah, uh, think about like, we, we need huge amounts of this renewable electricity. Just. Um, then, I mean, yeah, developing these technologies, it should have started a long time ago, basically. You often think yeah, like, okay, this is very difficult to develop and we're just starting with it and like, we should have done that earlier and, and it absolutely needs to start now and it needs to start now in all these sectors. Um, and uh, this is, I think, an important thought that uh, we should not just think about uh, 
minor improvements of existing technology where we maybe get 10-20% improvement but we need to think about breakthrough technologies like we need to think about technologies that can really bring down these emissions to zero. Um, and yeah, cheap wind and solar is the one thing that is uh, promising, but we should think about how can we have similar developments where a technology gets massively cheaper in other areas. And, and one thing that I think is a, a very key technology is electrolyzers, like to produce hydrogen. But there are other things. Um, yeah. And also, like in some sectors, the, uh, it, it already looks challenging to move the current demand to to electricity and to clean electricity and if we look at the growth projections it looks almost infeasible. So I think particularly in, in sectors that are that are extremely challenging, one would be long distance aviation, long distance flights, another would be cement. Uh, we should talk about how can we actually limit these sectors or even how can we shrink these sectors and not continue growing them. Yeah. Um, yeah, that was my talk. Um, thanks for listening. I think we will have a Q&A session afterwards. Yeah, thanks. Thanks a lot for the talk. Um, Hanno, can you hear me? We yeah. hopefully now have a Q&A session. Um, I could. Um, so, until now, there have been no questions uh, that that has um, have uh, received us uh, that we received. Um, if you are watching to this um, watching the stream and still have a question, please uh, just send it to us under the RC3 OYO hashtag on Twitter or at the IRC. Um, it's all in the stream details on um, the streaming page. Um, Hanno. I, 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 uh, when I, when I um, watched your talk, I, I thought, how do you cope with uh, thinking and doing research on such depressing topics and not going crazy, not giving up, um, and still having like interacting with that and, and not losing hope? How do you do that? Um, uh, okay, uh, I wonder how long I, this this should be, but uh, so uh, I mean, one thing is like I. I was kind of deep into these topics about a decade ago, and for several years i I like became interested in other topics and that all I had to do with frustration because I felt not much was going forward but I mean I really feel that we we are still far from from where we should be, but uh, things have definitely changed so if I observe these things like for example. I think I mentioned it in the talk that right now in the steel industry, you can really see that this is not just talking, but this is, uh, there's something happening. Uh, so, so I guess this is, uh, yeah, this is my answer to it, that I, I mean, we're still like only very much at the beginning of tackling these things seriously, but it's a very different discussion from like several years ago. Mm, okay, thank you. Um, I, I, I too think that these perspectives that you show, or like even with practical solutions on these other sectors, this is how you could decarbonize them is kind of giving hope. Uh, and it, it's kind of like it yeah. feels like there, there might be a solution to all these problems. Um, I thought, um, do you know if there's somebody uh, calculated it through what that might cost? So as far as I understood it, you can um, have the numbers of how much energy would we need to decarbonize everything and you can guess how much it maybe might cost to, to uh, install these replacement technologies and mm. do you know if somebody calculated a number how many billions of dollars we would we need to invest mm. in the next 10 20 years to uh, prevent a bigger climate crisis backlashes so i'm not really aware of a thorough scenario that would like factor in all the things particularly like you often have uh, where, where people start calculating but they only look at energy and don't look at something like chemistry or um I, I think, uh, like I, I read about a new calculation that was I think a Finnish research institute that seemed to be more more thorough than what I had seen before that was only a few days ago 
Um, it was actually after I recorded the talk. So, um, but that was about the energy need and not the not the cost of that. And also, like there there are a lot of uh, questions like, do you assume that we're just growing the economy going forward? That, then things get obviously harder. Like I, I mentioned the the example with aviation in the talk. Uh, they get to these huge numbers, but also they assume we will just have three times as, as many planes in the future as now. And these are obviously uh, factors that uh, you need to consider when you try to calculate something like that. Okay, thank you. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, I just thought, so usually in, in talks like this, I ask people, so what what do people have to do? So what's the call to action? What, what do, do we need to do? I mean, right now there is some sort of a climate social movement, but um, yeah. I would imagine that there's a difference between these uh, general, uh, what, what, what's general being, generally being said in these uh, social movements and these specific topics yeah. of we need to decarbonize that and in this industry that needs to change. Is there something for, for people listening who feel like I need to do something, is there something mm. you can tell them that they specifically uh, can tackle? So, so I think what, what really should happen is that more people ask questions. Like if you have a, if you have a company where you live in your city that, that is, I don't know, maybe producing hydrogen, uh, then like ask your local politicians, like uh, this company is probably producing lots of carbon emissions and when will they switch to green hydrogen? Like, um, like I feel a lot of these things, they don't have a lot of focus right now. And for example, there are still constructions of new facilities to produce hydrogen from fossil fuels. And they're, they're still like, uh, or there's uh, currently in the, in the UK, there's a discussion about a new coal mine for steel production. So, uh, and I think that this is like, like people should get more engaged about this. And I think a good way is like, look at maybe what's around you or maybe look at if you work somewhere, of course, like ask these questions, like what is the plan for this company to get carbon free? How, yeah. Cool, thank you. So far, oh, there comes a question from yeah, Twitter, okay, so which is appearing right now. What should a normal person do to help change slash change in their lifestyle to have the biggest impact? Um, okay, so I'm I, I'm a bit um, I don't know. Confl I have conflicting thoughts about how much we should focus on lifestyle changes because in the end, I think they can, will only ever play a small role. And what we really need to change is like, we, we need to change the bigger things and because we're not going to solve this by voluntary actions. But I mean, if you calculate these things, these things that have a big impact is like avoiding to fly, uh, not driving a car, uh, not eating meat, and, and also like living conditions, like having a, if you live in a, in a more isolated house or if you also choosing to live in a smaller flat, these are things that matter a lot. Okay, thank you. And that's another question that just came in, I think via Twitter. Um, and it says, what amount of energy could be safe if you, if you reused CO2 from e.g. cement production for the chemical sector instead of fueling the chemical sector from CCU? Um, Okay, so the repeat it or no, no, I understood the yeah. question. The, the 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 problem with that is that the the stuff you put into the chemical sector will at some point be emissions. So if you like you produce plastics and then they go into a waste incinerator and then you have the emissions at the end of the life of the, the product. So if you use the, the emissions from cement to produce chemicals then you kind of have a double use of these emissions, but you're not avoiding this, the emissions. So I don't think that this is a, a feasible long-term solution. We will really need both. Like we will need to, to, to avoid the cement emissions and we, we will need to source the chemicals from, from other carbon sources. Uh, and I, I mean, the, I don't have a number for the question, but I, I think it's not, yeah. Okay. Um, there Thanks. was a question on IRC. Do you see these? 
why just promote soda and when do you yeah. see that as well uh, yeah yeah then please just answer but uh, yeah. we have only a, a couple of more minutes left um so maybe that last quick answer and then then we have to move yeah. on but uh, please answer okay so uh, uh the thing with hydro is just that that in many places there's not a lot of potential to build new hydro and the potential is in many places already being used so so it makes sense to build more hydro but uh the solar and wind will will be the biggest chunks for future new renewable energy built all right hello thanks a lot for being here today thanks a lot for the q a uh, thank you for everybody who asked questions during our remote channels um, if you want to ask more questions, there's the discussion room. It's uh, in the stream right now. It's on discussion.rc3.oyo.social. Hanno is going to be there. And if you want to ask more questions, just go there and you have, can, can have a chat with others who listen to the talk and with Hanno. And with that, I wish you a nice evening and uh, thanks for having uh, been here today. Okay. Bye.